two disclaimers. First is that most of what I'm going to talk about today is really kind of described in more fulsome detail in this article. It came out earlier this year. Uh, my colleague Nick Lohman and I wrote this together in uh, Nature Review's Genetics. Um, and the second disclaimer I'll make is that I guess I'm what you would call a pandemic prevention skeptic or denialist. Um, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, could you predict the next pandemic? Um, and as I have been quoted by Ed Young is saying, I'm firmly in the no camp. I'm in the camp that believes we can do a much better job at surveillance and early detection and preventing these little flare ups from becoming the next pandemic. But in terms of predicting where and when it's going to happen and catching it before it happens, I think that's a bit of a pipe dream. So where the idea for this um, digital pathogen surveillance paradigm came about is kind of reflecting on uh, some of the lessons learned of pandemics past. And if there's one thing that's certain about a pandemic, it's that after the pandemic finishes, there's going to be a whole bunch of papers, what I call the pandemic lessons learned literature. After every single major epidemic pandemic, there's always a swath of papers saying, oh, we should have done this, or we could do this better next time. So let's go back in our little DeLorean time machine and visit uh, the pandemic lessons learned literature. It has an early start, uh, 1919, George Soper writing in science after the 1918 uh, influenza uh, pandemic. And he was saying some lessons learned around kind of understanding the basic biology of the, the causative agent and the, the prevalence of respiratory diseases in ordinary times. So at this point, the lessons learned were like, okay, what, what can we learn about the biology of this? The next pandemic lessons learned paper, I love this name, Max Shanholtz. Uh, Max Shanholtz, MD, uh, wrote after the uh, H2N2 pandemic. Um, he started to get into some of the issues that we still see this day, um, talking about things like cooperation between regional health departments, um, community engagement as being key in um, epidemic planning. But this is also an interesting paper because it marks the introduction of what I call uh, pandemic planning hubris and the first appearance of statements like this. We have learned a great deal from this experience that will surely better prepare us for the next pandemic. And we didn't. You know, we had SARS in 2003, and if you go into the SARS pandemic uh, hubris literature, you see the same sorts of things. Oh, this experience has better prepared the world for the anticipated and much feared next real pandemic. And that was, of course, H1N1, and we weren't really well prepared, were we? And again, after the H1N1 outbreak, you had this same sort of, oh, the lessons learned should be applied to ensure better preparedness for future pandemics. And spoiler alert, that didn't happen. Um, we had Ebola show up in West Africa. We had Zika virus show up in Brazil. And in the wake of outbreaks like these, it's been interesting to see that literature has taken a bit of a turn, and the literature is now containing statements like, hmm, the data suggests that the world remains ill-prepared to handle sustained responses and global pandemics. So finally, this hubris is starting to disappear, and we're realizing that we're not doing a very good job at early outbreak detection and response and management. So this got a bunch of people thinking, you know, what could we do better next time? And digital pathogen surveillance as a concept is just one of many possible futures, but it's the one that we've written about and have our name on, so it's the one I'm going to talk about. Um, and it basically sort of combines three ideas. The first is this emerging discipline of genomic epidemiology, and this is the space that I come from. Um, my work is all about how can we use genomics as a tool in public health to answer questions. My particular niche interest is in using genomics as a tool to understand person-to-person -person transmission and transmission dynamics, but as you'll see, genomics is also a really powerful tool for uh, diagnostics. Plus, when you add the whole portable sequencing component onto this, genomic epidemiology gets to be quite exciting. 
The second piece of this digital platform surveillance idea is digital epidemiology and coming up with a sort of early warning system that is scraping uh, digital signals or the digital footprints that we all everywhere in the world leave out there on the internet. Uh, and then finally, the last piece is One Health or more planetary health as we heard this morning, um, which is kind of like the, the bow that sits on top of the whole package or the wrapper that brings it all together. So I thought I'd talk about each of these three things, um, just a very general overview of what they are and how they come together in this new paradigm. So the first is uh, genomic epidemiology, the, the sandbox that I play in. So right now, if you are a public health agency, if you're a place like BC Center for Disease Control where I work, you have a number of different surveillance systems that are always on, always looking for potential outbreaks. And these could be anything from um, lab test positive results. Um, you know, your reference laboratory is constantly saying, okay, well, this week we had this many uh, flu positives, um, this many RSV positives. So maybe it's lab test data. Maybe it is physician billing data. Uh, in British Columbia, we have access to uh, when a doctor sees a patient, they have to put a billing code in for what they saw that patient for, and we can monitor that in real time. And sometimes the surveillance system is just an astute clinician calling in and going, hey, I've actually seen a lot of cases of blank in my practice this week. Is something going on? So one of these many surveillance systems will cue us to the fact that there's a potential outbreak. We're seeing more cases of a particular pathogen in a region over a particular time period than we would expect. So our next step is typically these days to do some sort of molecular epidemiology analysis. And when I say molecular epidemiology, I'm referring to things like genotyping analyses. Sometimes people call these DNA fingerprinting, but basically the microbial equivalent of of the DNA analysis techniques that you'd see on a crime scene show or when they're doing the Mori, you are not the father episodes. Um, people aren't interrogating the entire human genome when they're doing that sort of testing. They're just looking at a set of these 13 agreed upon VNTR loci. We have very similar schemes that have been established for different microbial pathogens. So we genotype uh, and we say, okay, well out of the 20 cases of mumps virus that we saw uh, this week, how many of them have the same genotype and are likely part of the same outbreak that represents some sort of common exposure or a transmission chain. And from there, to really kind of fill in the blanks, we have to rely on field epidemiology. In the TB world, we call this contact investigation. We're going out and we're talking to patients and we're trying to get a sense of what the exposures that might have led to their particular disease were. Did they have contact with a particular person? Did they eat a food at a particular restaurant? We're trying to draw the arrows between cases and really map the outbreaks. The problem with genotyping methods, though, are they're just not that great. Um, they're only, in the best case scenario, interrogating you know, point, less than 0.1% of the complete genome of an organism. So you're getting kind of a low resolution view. Um, there's a cluster of cases, and that's it. It doesn't tell you anything about the direction of transmission. You really need that field epi data uh, to connect the dots. And we don't always, in public health, have the resources to be able to go out and do those sorts of investigations. So I kind of liken it to with genotyping methods, it's like taking a picture and removing 99% of the pixels. You have a rough idea of what's there, but it's only if you look at all of the pixels, if you look at the entire genome, that the picture becomes a lot clearer. Surprise, surprise, it's a cat. Um, anybody that knows me knows you can't get through one of my slide presentations with at least one cat. So here's the cat. Spoiler alert, there's another cat coming up too. Um, so this idea of reading the entire genome of a pathogen rather than just DNA fingerprinting it has really given rise to this domain of genomic epidemiology. Let's read whole genome sequences, get at kind of the ultimate genotype, and use that to reconstruct transmission. And it's a very simple analogy. Um, the kid's game of telephone, kids sit in line, somebody whispers a sentence to the first kid, who whispers it to the next kid, to the next kid, to the next kid, to the next kid. 
next kid. Sentence reaches the end of the line. Kid at the end says what they heard. The kid at the beginning of the sentence says what the original sentence was. And everybody laughs because the sentence is mutated as it's spread from kid to kid to kid. Same thing is happening to a pathogen's genome as it is moving from person to person to person forward in time through an outbreak. So really, um, what we're doing is just the telephone game. We're sequencing uh, pathogen genomes, bacterial genomes, viral genomes. We're looking for mutations in common between particular isolates that suggest maybe there's a relationship, maybe A transmitted to B or B transmitted to C. I'll show you a couple little quick examples just to kind of calibrate you. This is some mumps stuff that we've been doing lately. Mumps has kind of made a bit of a comeback, as you're probably all aware. Uh, this is a year of genotyping data. This is a year of DNA fingerprinting data from British Columbia. And genotype G viruses dominate. But if you break that down a little bit further and you kind of go one tier down, we're still not at the whole genome level yet. We're just, you know, one tier down um, and using a more refined genotyping technique, we can see that what look to be sort of one continuous wave of genotype G viruses are actually multiple kind of independent outbreaks. And then if we zoom in on just one of those, we're going to zoom in on just the blue cases here, we find that we get a lot more genomic diversity. This is a time-labeled tree, but there's a lot of diversity happening here. If we look right down at the individual genome level when we start to do genomic epidemiology, these are 66 mumps virus genomes that we've sequenced. The mumps virus is just over 15,000 base pairs long. We don't care about the positions that don't change over the course of the outbreak. We're not interested in those. So this is a multiple sequence alignment where I've pulled out just the columns out of that 15,000 base pair alignment um, where there is informative variation, a mutation that arises in one isolate and is found in other downstream isolates. And that's what it looks like. You can group uh, all of the viruses that you've sequenced and visually just see, oh, here's a group over here, here's a group over here, here's a group over here. Uh, the next slide is the, don't tweet a picture of this slide. Um, this is the Pacific Northwest Circle of Trust. I've included place names on the next slide, so shh, keep this a secret. Um, this is what those, uh, if we represent each virus as a different color, each of these groups is a different color, this is sort of my interpretation of an epidemic curve. We're moving forward in time as we go this way, um, and viruses are colored according to their sequence, according to the pattern of mutations that they have, and they're arranged by geography. And so you can see there is quite a lot of spatial and temporal structure to this outbreak. The green virus, for example, never escapes the Vancouver area. The cases in and around our ski resort were virtually entirely variations on this orange virus theme. There was an introduction into Vancouver Island, and it was the red virus that took off. And if you look at contacts between individuals, um, this is one particular case here who we know had contact with those particular cases. We've got multiple instances of these uh, in this particular outbreak, and the viruses are identical to each other. So this is really what I mean when we say genomic epidemiology. We've done lots of work on this. Um, how can you reconstruct transmission patterns by combining evolutionary modeling with mathematical modeling, your sort of classic SIR dynamics? <clears throat> We've also looked at how you can even use genomic information not just to determine who transmitted to who, but also when that transmission event happened. Uh, most of my work is in tuberculosis, where we've got this problem of people being infected at one point in time, um, but then activating anywhere from you know, a few weeks to many, many years to decades later. So can we time this using genomic data? And sure enough, we can. So the type of work that I do uh, just up the road is things like, We've more recently gone back and sequenced, I guess we're at about 1,800 TB genomes now, representing every transmitted case of TB in British Columbia going back to 2005. And for each cluster, each um, group of cases that we find are related by a particular, you know, no more than, say, 10 mutations apart, we can go in and through a combination of the genomic data and our field epidemiology data, our contact investigation, actually go in and determine who transmitted to who. So this was a cluster of cases that by genotyping was one big cluster, but by whole genome sequencing, you could subdivide into multiple clusters and you could finally start to connect the dots. And the really fun thing that you can do here is start to ask questions like, what makes this person and this person different from this person? What makes 
a super spreader or somebody responsible for multiple secondary infections different from somebody that's just sort of a dead end in the transmission chain. So this is really the notion of genomic epidemiology, the background that I come from, and it was really exciting to see this play out in real time. A lot of this work has been retrospective to date, but in real time in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. This is Raymond, he's a lab technician, uh, and he's working in Guinea, and he is using the Oxford Nanopore Minion uh, DNA sequencer just plugged into his laptop uh, to sequence Ebola virus in the field. And just as a little preview of what Trevor will be telling you about next, those genome sequences were being shared in real time with the world, um, used by WHO epidemiologists to draw connections between cases, but also sort of crowdsourced for analysis by a whole bunch of people really interested in viral phylogenetics and phylogenetics. And so not only were we getting an individual picture of person-to-person -person transmission events on the ground, but we're really starting to understand the regional epidemiology of this virus as well. So it was really exciting to see this technique used as part of outbreak response. A lot of the DNA sequencing that we do happens on a bit of a slow time scale. What if we could do it faster? What if we could do diagnosis and epidemiological tracking at the same time? It's not feasible to take something like a high seq X into the field, but it is feasible to take something like one of these Oxford nanopore minions out there. So you can imagine, as part of this digital pathogen surveillance program, something like a kind of clinical metagenomic diagnostic slash genomic epidemiology station out there in the field as part of early outbreak response. For that Nature Reviews Genetics article, um, they ask you to submit uh, an art idea, and then they draw their own version of it. So this is what I submitted for a figure <laughs> explaining why doing clinical metagenomics in the field is exciting, but why it's also difficult. Um, this is my interpretation of a mobile medical unit staffed by very capable stick people, um, but they did a, a much better version <laughs> of the figure in the end, even though nobody has a face, which is a bit <laughs> creepy. I mean, at least least in mine. They were mostly a bit sad or neutral, but they did have faces. Um, so clinical metagenomics is, I think, the, the exciting future state that we are going to be at very soon, where if there is an emergent outbreak, you bring your portable DNA sequencers in, you've got your little menion over here plugged in, so you've got your mobile medical unit and patient samples are being processed, analyzed. You can use this for uh, diagnostics. You know, is this Ebola or is it something else? Can we rapidly uh, rule in or rule out people as belonging to an outbreak? And can we do that genomic epidemiology mutation by mutation tracking to figure out, okay, what's the exact pattern of spread? What's causing this particular outbreak? Who are people that we really need to follow up with around transmission? That being said, I'm not gonna read all all of these, but there's a lot of challenges with doing clinical metagenomics and making sure we can actually detect the material that we're interested in, but this is really quite promising. And if you go back to that Ed Young article that I was quoted in, uh, our good friend Christian Anderson was also quoted in there too, um, and I like this statement because it really kind of summarizes, I think, the future potential of genomic epidemiology. It says, forget about detecting the virus before it jumps. Forget even about detecting the first patient. Detect the first cluster of cases. And that's possible if health workers routinely search for viruses in people who live at disease fault lines. And the advent of portable sequencers makes these searches a reality. So. How do we find those places? How do we find those fault lines? Well, this is where the next part of that three-part digital pathogen surveillance bit comes in. Uh, here's another cat. <laughs> um, so if you work in a place like BC or if you work in a place like King County, you've got a variety of good traditional surveillance systems that are out there detecting disease. I mentioned a couple of them off the top, but you basically got people looking for signals of infectious disease. What happens at those disease fault lines? What happens in the places where emerging infectious disease comes from where we don't have the CAT? We don't have the traditional surveillance system. Or what happens in places where we do have traditional surveillance systems, but we just want them to work better? That is where the second part comes in, digital epidemiology, or sometimes uh, called digital disease detection. And this is simply the notion that we leave tremendous digital footprints out there, and we can scrape 
those digital footprints, we can search them for signs of disease. And the great thing about it is that the internet and social media and this digital ecosystem exist in places where public health infrastructure, traditional surveillance systems, laboratories may not necessarily exist. Probably the first instance of digital epi that most people will remember was uh, Google's flu trends. Uh, it didn't work that well in the end. It worked well to begin with, um, but then, like so many models, it fell victim to overfitting, but it's kind of a good first example of, hey, you can scrape people's search queries uh, and use it as a barometer for what might be going around in a particular population. Another cool example of a quirky one, this is nemesis or n-emesis, because it's about food poisoning, emesis, vomiting, ha ha ha. Uh, Adam Sadelek built this one, and it looks at Twitter uh, feeds to try and identify people that had checked in at a restaurant recently, and within 100 hours of that check-in, started tweeting things that would be indicative of food poisoning. Um, this is a quirky example, maybe not ready for prime time, but one that certainly is, is John Brownstein's healthmap.org. I took this screenshot just the other day to see what was going around in Seattle. Um, there's all sorts of interesting stuff afoot. Um, but this worked really well in the Ebola outbreak. Um, the first signal on health map that something was afoot was uh, March 14th. Health map is basically just scraping news sites, scraping public health websites, a variety of sources from around the world in a variety of languages, parsing all that information. There's piles of natural language processing that goes into this, um, and looking for blips, looking for things that might indicate an outbreak. Um, so they reported something on March 14th based on this French language paper in Guinea. They reported something on March 19th, and again on the 21st. And March 22nd was when this virus was actually identified as Ebola and when most of the world sort of sat up and took notice. But, you know, Health Map had been there a week or so ahead of time. So digital epidemiology might be one of these early alert systems, something that we can use to say, okay, what's going on out there in the world? Let's not wait until it's confirmed as Ebola by some laboratory. Let's look for that initial signal. Let's look for that March 14th news story, and let's get our little tiny portable sequencer out there to try and figure out what's going on. Last part of the equation is this idea of one health or planetary health. One health is let's look at the animals, let's look at the environment, and let's look at human health together. You can't consider any one in the absence of the other. They're all so intimately connected to each other that a ripple in one creates ripples in the other. So where One Health, I think, kind of feeds into this nicely is that we don't have birth announcements for new infectious diseases. We don't get this like, oh, congratulations, you've got a new Ebola outbreak. It would be great if we did, our jobs would be so much easier, but we usually find out about these things once they've grown into a, a big bad monster. So maybe One Health can help us figure out where to look this is a great paper, uh, 10 years old now, um, but this is mapping disease hotspots. And this is saying what sort of factors are associated with emerging infectious diseases. And the answer turns out to be a lot of the things that we heard about from Dr. Frumkin this morning um, in that planetary health talk, things like biodiversity, changing land use, um, civil unrest and breakdown, particular weather patterns. This gives us a map telling us where to look. So One Health kind of says, here's where you might look. Digital epidemiology, you can kind of train your sensors on those areas and go, okay, are we seeing any signals of anything unusual? And when we do, you throw the genomic epidemiology at it and you see what's going on. So this is how Nature Reviews Genetics summarized uh, our model. I actually prefer my version of this drawing. I think it's just, it's more naive, but more fulsome. It's got a lot more information in this version. So basically, you've got in places where you think you're going to have emerging infectious diseases in the hot spots that One Health tells you about, you've got constant sort of um, low-grade sampling of humans, of the environment, of animals, particularly humans at the human-animal interface, farmers, veterinarians, factory workers, things like that. Um, and you're constantly looking for signals, um, either genomic signals of disease emergence or informational digital signals of disease emergence. That sort 
sort of um, cues you to ramp up your sequencing efforts and really try and understand, okay, what's the agent here? How is it spreading? That data is going to be released in real time, shared with the community. You've got people, this is our academic corner over here, you can tell because they're working on a whiteboard, and they're sharing results with each other, um, releasing things to the web, doing these sort of open lab notebook things that I think Trevor might touch upon in his presentation, but this kind of brings the whole thing together. So that is, in a nutshell, this idea, this nascent idea of digital pathogen surveillance that we have. Um, lots of people contributed to this. Here's some more cats. Um, happy to answer a couple questions now, and then some more in the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Okay. Any questions from the audience? First one, so how do you get DNA out into the mini ion? I mean, you have to isolate it, and what you do with RNA viruses, and how this targeted sequencing? Yeah, or? yeah. So the question is, how do you get DNA onto the minion? Um, library prep is always the most challenging part of any experiment right now. Um, right now, you're basically you've got a couple options. If you're doing viral uh, genome sequencing and you're trying to do it directly from sample, you'll do you'll design some PCR amplicons, uh, PCR primers to generate amplicons that should cover most of the genome, and you sequence those. Products. So you have to know which virus you're looking for. In some cases. Yeah. You can also just put everything yeah. on there. As long as you lyse the cells and just run a traditional extraction kit, you can just throw whatever you want on there. There's going to be a lot of human contaminating DNA. Uh, we're getting better at getting rid of that both in the sample prep step and bioinformatically as you're doing the sequencing and, of course, as you're doing the analysis. But one of the big things that I think all sequencing companies are really excited about now, they realize that the sequencing is basically a solved problem, and the hardest part is the sample preparation. So they're really trying to move people um, to sequencing as close to specimen as possible. Um, so I think, you know, Oxford Nanopore, for example, mm -hmm. They've got this tiny tube that they're trying to develop. So you load your raw sample, you know, blood, CSF, soil, mud, feces, whatever, load it into the little tube. It does the lysis in the tube. You're able to extract the DNA, kind of push it out the other end. It then goes to sit on this other box that does the library prep step, and that box exists, and we've run it, and it works, and it takes about an hour and a half to get the DNA ready for sequencing. And when that step is done, you just open that box, take your pipetter, grab the DNA, and pipette it right onto the minion. Oh. So all your sequencing stuff should be able to fit in a lunch bag, and you can take it out into the field. OK, thanks. No problem. So thank you. So um, with I noticed in your sequence alignment that you had, mm -hmm. everything was a nice um, haplotype. And with malaria infections, what we typically see, whether it's because of a reinfection or just the diversity of the what was in the mosquito's blood meal, um, is that you'll have a, a swarm, you'll have a population. Yeah. And so do you see this with viruses, that with some viruses more than others, and sort of, especially with Ebola, I'd be interested to hear what's kind of, kind of the, the composition of a typical infection in terms Yeah, of that's diversity. a great question. It's going to vary every time depending on what bug you're dealing with and the duration of infection. Um, one thing that's really neat uh, is that you can actually use that variety as a marker of transmission too. Um, so just to give you an example of that, in TB, um, when people are infected for a while, you get a bit of within-host diversity arising, and you can see the point. You can see in an outbreak the person in which a mutation arises um, because it'll be a mixed population in the sequencing reads. It might be like a 20% minor variant, and you can be like, oh, that's the person that everybody that has this fixed version of the SNP had to have been downstream from that person. So depends on the virus. Is it RNA, DNA, or is it a bacterium? Depends on the nature of the infection, acute versus chronic. Depends on um, is there a super infection? Can you be infected with multiple strains at a time? Um, so we're definitely aware of that and we're trying to use it for good instead of confusion and evil. OK, great. Yeah, great that was the, se the second part of the question is how can you use that? And yeah, both within yeah. one host and also, you know, as, as does the diversity diminish over time or as you adapt to culture and those sorts of things. So that's interesting. Yeah, to yeah. That's an area that a lot of people are just starting to get into. Bill Hanna just done some really nice work on this um, and looking at rare variants in Ebola virus as markers of transmission. And we do it in TB and we've seen like beautiful, beautiful examples where you're like, oh, that's the person in which the SNP arose. I know exactly who is kind of the bow tie in the network of this outbreak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Gustavo? No. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so you highlighted the, or the um, 
farms. That's mm -hmm. the place to check for zoonotic, I guess, uh, transmission. Yep. How about urban ur urban environments, subways? Is that the uh, oh, good yeah. location to uh, be checked? Oh, yeah, the subway microbiome paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, definitely urban environments, I think, are interesting places to look. My favorite example of this um, is some stuff that's happening at MIT right now. They have their Underworlds project, and that's like, can we sample the stuff that exists in our sewer system and use it as a barometer for population health? So they're doing everything from um, looking at metabolism metabolites of drugs in the sewers um, to looking for signals of pathogens in the sewers as well. So I think in urban environments, if you get below the surface of the city and do uh, what I years ago referred to as sewage genomics, um, but I think it kind of accurately reflects what it is, just sequence what comes out of people to understand what's going on in people, uh, you can actually detect what's going on in a big way. So I personally think that um, rather than sort of individual farm level surveillance, probably the first implementation of this is going to be at that more pooled level where like you're sequencing from an entire neighborhood sewer system, you're not looking at one household, you're looking at a community and sort of doing the farm equivalent of that. But yep, people are definitely looking at uh, urban environments as a, a sentinel for bugs. All right. Let's thank Jennifer again. Thank you. Thanks.